Hello, everyone, and welcome to FileSeminar.org. The current theme is machine learning for the second time, and this is the first talk in a series of four talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions. Today's speakers are Anna Zhukova and Jacob Vaznika, sorry, Jakob Vaznika. Anna's initial training is in computer science and math. She did her PhD on metabolic network modeling with David Sherman at Eniria Bordeaux. She discovered phylogenetics after joining Olivier Gasquil's team in the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Broadly speaking, Anna's interests are mathematical modeling and algorithms for computational biology of pathogens. Anna is currently a research engineer of, in the bioinformatics and biostatistics hub at Institut Pasteur, where she develops methods and tools for phylogenetic and phylogeographic analyses of viral and bacterial spreads. Jakob did his PhD with Ellen Morlon and Anna Zhukova at the Institut Pasteur and Institut de Biologie à l'École Normale Supérieure before uh, obtaining an MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation. Broadly speaking, his interests revolve around public health, epidemiology, AI, and innovation. Jakob is currently a data science coach in a French governmental entrepreneurship program focused on promoting innovation and driving digital transformation within the central administration. Well, that sounds important. Uh, welcome both, and thank you for participating. Thanks a lot, Eric. So I'm going to start on our talk on phylogenomics. So I'll start with the more like mathematical, classical mathematical modeling part, and then Jakub is going to continue with the deep learning. So the question that we're interested in is uh, how can we quickly estimate uh, R node and other epidemiological parameters for pathogen spreads? And in classical epidemiology, like to do that, we use incidence data, survey data. However, especially in the beginning of the epidemic, this data might be scarce, like people may give inaccurate information on the service and also like the information on transmission history is rarely available because it's uh, difficult to obtain. However, what we can use instead is sequence data. And this is like really the moment to use the sequence data because sequencing has been advancing at a tremendous speed. And for example, for SARS-CoV-2, we have more than 10 million sequences available on the GZ uh, database. So the way it works is uh, that we sequence pathogens of infected individuals, and we use the information on the mutations that uh, their genomes have accumulated between transmissions in order to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree. So if on top of that, we've sequenced not everyone at the same time, but like uh, we've sequenced through time, then we can use the sampling dates in order to transform this tree into a data tree where the branches are measured in the units of time, for example, in years, and uh, there are dates associated with uh, the internal nodes of the tree. So for example, the date of the root would correspond to the beginning of the epidemic represented by this tree. So then we can use this tree to estimate epidemiological parameters. And that's what interests us. And uh, the advantage of uh, doing it like that instead of like classical approaches is that uh, we have lots of sequence data that uh, sequences generally don't lie and that we have some information on the transmission history for example like the internal nodes in this tree roughly correspond to the moments of transmissions so there are difficulties in this approach um, that are due to the fact that the computational methods haven't quite scaled up at the same speed as the sequencing has advanced. And uh, there are bottlenecks both for tree reconstruction for very large data sets. And recently there have been, um, like many people have been working on this bottleneck, especially for SARS-CoV-2, and there have been several methods proposed uh, that can handle much larger data sets. But also there are computational bottlenecks on this, this step, which estimates epidemiological parameters from a very large tree. And here, among the recent work, there's been uh, this paper by Luca and Penel, where they propose a general approach that applies to uh, many models with uh, uh, different discrete traits. And they've implemented it for some of the models in mi micro evolution. However, like the models I'm going to talk about uh, today and that Jakub is going to talk about today, um, they don't fit into the implementation. So in this talk, we are interested in uh, addressing like this computational bottleneck. 
And first, we're going to do it with a more mathematical approach. And uh, I'll start by uh, introducing the phylogenomic models. So there have been several great uh, phylo seminars recently on birth death models, but like for the sake of completeness, I'll introduce them once again. So in the phylogenomics setting, uh, the model birth death model with incomplete uh, sampling was introduced by Tanya Stadler. Uh, this is uh, the model that is analogy uh, to the classical epidemiological SIR model, susceptible uh, infectious removed. However, here we assume that we are at the very beginning of the epidemic, at the exponential phase, and the um, susceptible population is really large, so we don't model the dependency on the uh, number of susceptible individuals. So in this model, we have one state which is infectious, an individual in this state might transmit their pathogen further at a certain rate lambda. Lambda is a constant rate, and all the rates and all the models we're going to present today are constant. So in the transmission tree here, uh, the transmission would correspond to an internal node, where the donor individual transmitted their pathogen to the recipient individual, and a new branch started. So like here, the donor branch is indicated with a little star each time. Another thing that could happen to the infectious individual is that they might stop being infectious at a removal rate psi. For example, because they healed, because they self-isolated, because they started the treatment, or because they died. And this would correspond in our tree to the leaves or tips. So the branch stopped, like the individual can't transmit further. Upon the removal, we might sample uh, their pathogen at a certain probability rho. So if we sample their pathogen, then the leaf will be observed and will have a sequence associated with this uh, leaf. However, we don't sample everyone and there are some unobserved parts in our transmission tree. With this model, we can estimate such epidemiological parameters as the reproductive number, the number of secondary infections, and the infectious time, which is one divided by psi. So in practice, when we reconstruct the tree from the uh, sequence data, we won't have the unobserved parts, and we also won't have the branch colorings. We won't know who is the donor and who is the recipient unless we have some deep sequencing data. And therefore, we'll need to integrate of all the possibilities while resolving uh, the model. So Tanya Stadler proposed the master equations describing this model. Uh, they contain two types of functions. So there are Ls, which are likelihood densities of evolving as observed in the tree, starting at a certain branch. So for example, we could start on this branch at a certain time t. The time here goes from zero, the time of the root, to the time of the last sample tip. And also we have uh, another type of function, which I use, which represent the probabilities of evolving unobserved starting at a certain time. So the, nowhere in the subtree we, we could sample anyone. So nothing is sampled in the subtree. So with this function, we can express the likelihood of the tree is uh, as the likelihood density of starting at the time zero on the root branch. Like here, the length of the root branch is zero. The good news is that uh, for this model, we have a closed form solution that you can find in uh, this paper. And uh, the thing to keep in mind is that uh, in order for this model to be identifiable, we need to fix one of the three parameters. So the parameters are lambda, psi, and rho. And in practice, typically, it's a rho that is being fixed because it's easy to estimate from other sources of information. So. Uh, after that, like uh, Tanya Stadler still and collaborators extended this model, this basic model, uh, to incorporate the possibility of having different types of individuals. And they call it a multi type birth death uh, framework. And here I'll present you uh, one representative of this uh, framework the birth death exposed infectious model, BDEI, uh, that models uh, pathogens within an incubation period. So for example, SARS-CoV-2 or Ebola. So these and other multi-type birth death models are 
pilot dynamic analogies of uh, classical compartmental models in epidemiology. And um, however, like we're still assuming that we're in at the exponential phase of the epidemic. And so that um, the susceptible compartment is just like there are um, unlimited susceptible individuals. So in the BDEI model, uh, the infectious individual transmits the pathogen at a certain rate lambda. However, the recipient is at first at the state E exposed when they're already infected, but not yet infectious. And they will eventually become infectious at a certain rate uh, mu, which is also constant. So in our transmission tree, uh, the transmission, the recipient branch is always E, and then the state changes happen along the branches of our tree. So these are yeah, anagenetic transmissions, and these are cladogenetic uh, changes. Um, with this model, and then we can still uh, remove the infectious individual, the, the rate psi, and sample their pathogen upon removal. So on top of reproductive number and the infectious time, with this model, we can estimate the incubation period, which is 1 divided by mu. Again, as before, uh, in practice, when we reconstruct the tree from the pathogen sequence data, we'll only have the uh, observed parts. We won't have the branch colorings. We won't know who transmitted to whom. And we'll have to integrate over all the possibilities when uh, resol while resolving the model. So for this model, the master equations are similar to the ones for BDS. Um, the main difference is that now we also have different states. So now we have uh, the likelihood densities of evolving as in the tree starting on a certain branch at a certain time, but also in a certain state. And the same for unobserved probabilities. And the, uh, to calculate the likelihood of the tree, we calculate the likelihood density of evolving as in the tree starting uh, at the root branch at time zero in the state i, because i is the only state that can actually transmit. Uh, the bad news is that uh, for this model and other multi-type birth death models, we don't have a closed form solution. So we need to resolve these equations numerically. And for example, to calculate the likelihood of the tree, like through this initial condition, um, the likelihood that this branch depends on the likelihoods of the child branches for both uh, states which in turn depend on the grandchild branches, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this recursive dependency that in practice we resolve with the pruning algorithm when we start at the tips and we slowly climb the tree, calculating the likelihoods till we arrive to the root. So a BDI model was a special case of multi-type birth death models. So this is a more general framework where we could have D states, we could have uh, state changes, um, and the corresponding rates between all couples of states. So we could have transmission rates where the recipient individual could be in any possible state. Uh, we could have uh, removal rates for all of the states and the sampling probabilities. Like in practice, like depending on the model, some of them might be zero, some of them might be equal, etc. So for example, for BDEI, the um, uh, rate of change from infectious to exposed, uh, is zero. So the properties of these models are such that uh, the differential equations uh, don't have a closed form solution. They need to be resolved numerically. And uh, they have this recursive dependency between the parent and child branches, which makes them hard to parallelize. So in the best case scenario, we'll still need the order of the tree height uh, consecutive steps to um, calculate the likelihood of the tree. And uh, on top of that, because in this initial condition, we have these likelihood densities that are multiplied, that could they could tend to go to zero as um, we progress in the tree towards the root, and if the tree is large. And this could be problematic uh, during numerical resolution, because these numbers might be, become very small and uh, might lead to underflow issues. So because of all these difficulties in the currently available gold, gold standard implementation, which is the Bayesian uh, tool BEAST2, 
we can only apply it to data sets of several hundreds of samples, like up to maybe 1,000 samples, while um, we have these much larger data sets um, available nowadays. It's, and it's a shame we can't um, analyze them. And so that's the motivation between uh, the work we're going to present to you today. And at first, we're going to look at the mathematics behind these models closer. So first of all, if we look at the equations for uh, multi-type birth death models, like here on the example of the birth death exposed infectious model, we can notice that uh, the part for the unobserved probabilities is actually self-defined. It doesn't depend on the else, on the likelihood densities. And then if we look at the likelihood densities, that what we can notice is that these two differentials, the right-hand side is actually linear and with respect to Ls, and it doesn't have any constant term, which means that if we rescale both of them by the same non-zero constant, then uh, this part of the equation won't change at all. And the only thing that would change is the initial conditions. So let us rescale them by uh, the constant which corresponds to the initial condition for the uh, Li. Like for each branch, we're going to do it independently. So if we do that, then we'll obtain the equations that are much simpler uh, in a way that uh, we have this very simple initial condition where we won't have any underflow issue because it's simply one. Like here it stays zero and this part like doesn't change at all. But another thing that happens is that uh, there is no recursive dependency anymore. So before there was this recursive dependency on child branches in the initial condition, and now we just simply have one. So we can resolve it like for every branch independently. And uh, what do these P's mean uh, for the tree? It's, they are basically the probabilities of evolving as on a branch I in the tree, starting in a given state S, so either I or E at a certain time, and finishing at the end of the branch in the state i. In the state i, because for the BDI model, i is the only state that can transmit, so it's uh, which corresponds to an internal load, and it's also the only state get, that can be removed, which corresponds to a sampled tip. So because of all that, uh, we can calculate the likelihood as an explicit non-recursive uh, formula. So here we have a log likelihood that contains the sampling of n tips and uh, n minus one, like the number of internal nodes transmissions, where we consider either that the left branch is the donor and the right one is the recipient or the other way around. So in general, like using this rescaling technique, uh, for any multi-type birth death model, uh, we still need to solve the ordinary differential equations numerically, but we can pre-calculate uh, the piece for each branch of the tree independently. So it makes it very easy to parallelize uh, up to a constant time if we have as many cores as we have branches in the tree. And because the initial conditions are very simple, either zeros or ones, we don't have this uh, underflow uh, due to uh, the very small values at the initial conditions. On top of that, uh, like if our model has is such, or our tree is such that we know the states of the internal nodes, then we could have this explicit likelihood formula as we had for BDI. While in general case, like to we'll still need to use the pruning algorithm to recombine the P's into uh, the likelihood formula. But uh, this part would be uh, very light because all the computationally heavy stuff will be done in parallel. So we, yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I um. So just just to double check, this is all exact. Uh, there's no approximations here. No, no, there are no approximations. I mean, like you still need to resolve the equations numerically, so that hasn't changed. Right, of course. But right. but at least you can do it in parallel. Yeah, and this is like, it's exactly the same equations, just represented in a different way. OK, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we were very happy like when we discovered all that. Uh, but then we realized that actually Luca and Pinel 
discovered that before us and in a more general uh, framework. So they proposed this flow matrix that allows to perform parallel computations. And so like uh, what we bring here is the interpretation of the flow for these type of models um, as uh, these P P's, which are the um, uh, probabilities of evolution along the branches. So we implemented uh, these um, parallelizable uh, equations for the birth, death, exposed infectious model in the maximum likelihood framework. So my co-author Frederick Esch, who is a specialist in numerical approximation, um, resolve, like wrote code that resolves uh, these equations in C++ that we then wrapped in Python 3. Um, and our maximum likelihood uh, estimator also can estimate uh, confidence intervals with the Wilkes method that is based on maximum likelihood. And it scales really well with the large data set sizes. So for example, for a tree of 10,000 tips, it takes two minutes to estimate the parameters and the errors are, are small. So if one day you want to try it, uh, there are different ways how you could use it. And so the last um, thing I'd like to talk in this part of the talk is which parameter should we fix? So as I mentioned, like the multi-type birth death models are non-identifiable unless we fix one of the parameters. And so here we performed a simulation study where we simulated uh, 100 trees of um, several thousand tips for different parameter values. And we estimated uh, the parameters fixing uh, one of the four uh, BDI parameters. So in the blue, we have uh, mu, the state change rate fixed. In yellow, we have the transmission rate fixed. In green, the removal rate. And in orange, the sampling probability. And here I'm plotting the relative error. So the smaller, the better. And what, can, what we can see that for all the model parameters here and the epidemiological parameters, it seems like the best strategies are to fix either the sampling probability in orange or the removal rate psi. And this is good because these are actually the parameters that are quite easier to estimate from other sources. Like for example, observing for how long um, an individual stays infectious to estimate the psi or observing what's the proportion of sampled individuals with the total number of infected population um, to estimate uh, the role. So that was all on the mathematical modeling part. So we were happy that we could speed up these models. However, like maybe for more difficult models, it might not be the case. And therefore, Jakub is going to tell you about the deep learning approach. Yes, thank you, Anna. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see. Yes, perfect. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. I'm really happy to be able to present here. Thank you, Eric, for, for the invitation. So in the first part, you've seen um, how to treat one of the pain points when using, when using birth death models in phylodynamics. Um, now I will present an alternative approach that we developed um, at Institut Pasteur that is based on deep learning. And so deep learning here is not used just uh, as a hype method and everyone is using it. Um, here, the purpose is uh, to use it to, uh, to train it, to learn <clears throat> the function that lays between phylogenies and the parameter values. And so uh, first, let's assume that we have our dated phylogeny. Let's assume that we have a model under which uh, we want to study this phylogeny. Uh, so this is just a basic birth death model that um, Anna presented, just with a bit renamed parameters. And uh, once again, we want to estimate here the, the infectious time and the basic reproduction number. And so when we want to do that, uh, there are several ways uh, how we can uh, infer the parameter values. One way is to use maximum likelihood. So we have the likelihood formula that uh, depends on uh, the parameter values. And we maximize the formula 
and maximization of this formula will give us the parameter estimates. And so theoretically, it's the gold standard approach. Um, the idea is that if you have a closed form solution of the likelihood, uh, you should get as accurate estimates as it's possible. Nevertheless, as we have seen uh, with BDI, you may have a couple of problems with more complex models than this, this one, than this basic birth death model. Uh, you may have not closed form solution, but typically you may have a set of ODEs uh, that you have to approximate numerically. So this might be quite slow for complex models and work in practice just for relatively small trees. And as well, um, as you have these numerical approximations, uh, this may yield um, some imprecision. Uh, and another kind of issue is when you develop a new model, you have to establish this likelihood uh, formula. You have to find an expression. And sometimes you work for a couple of months uh, just to find out that there is no expression of likelihood formula. Um, and this is kind of a downer. And it may have an implication on the kind of models that we are using today, um, because, because probably there is a bias in the design, uh, only in the models for which uh, you find a good approximation or expression of the likelihood formula uh, are published and then used. Otherwise, there is an alternative approach, which is a simulation-based inference method, the approximate Bayesian computation. The idea is the following. Uh, you have your real tree, you encode it um, in form of summary statistics. So it's just somehow metrics uh, that are intended to conserve all the important information that is in the tree, that are measured on the tree. And uh, then you emit a hypothesis on the um, prior values, of the, on the prior of the values of the parameters that you want to estimate, and you simulate I don't know, let's say 10,000 trees. You encode these trees into summary statistics, and then you perform rejection algorithm. So the idea is that you take uh, the summary statistics of your real tree, and you try to find the simulations that are closest uh, to this tree. Uh, typically, you would use Euclidean distance. And the closest simulations will then give you the posterior di distribution, the estimates. Um, for your real tree. And so it's a method that is um, that can be for complex models faster, that is fairly accurate, that is likely a tree. There are many adjustments uh, that were done uh, to, to make it work even better. Um, then there are some points that might be a bit, um, might represent somehow pain points. Uh, one of them is that this method relies on the summary statistics. And typically, when you develop a new model, you would still have to design uh, new summary statistics, which can take some time, uh, because you have to make sure that the set of summary statistics convey enough information for the problem of at hand. And um, as well, another point is the rejection algorithm. Uh, as I said, typically, you use Euclidean distance. But actually, the simulations that are closest uh, in terms of Euclidean distance may not be actually the, the simulations that are closest to your real tree. Uh, so this is, these are the pain points that we try to face uh, using deep learning. And so as I said, the idea is to uh, use very flexible statistical learning approach to learn the function that lays between phylogeny and the parameter values. And so to train the neural networks to predict uh, parameter values. And so typically, we would use large number of simulations. In what I will present you, we have used, for example, 4 million trees, covering very large uh, parameter subspace, covering trees of different sizes. Uh, so it will be 200 to 500 tips. And um, we encode them into a bijective full representation. I will show you a bit uh, how we encode them and train train the neural network to predict the values. And so the idea is then, once you have trained uh, the neural network, you will be able to use it on real data um, and you will get immediate, uh, immediate results. Uh, it's a method that is likelihood-free, rejection-free, um, uh, as well, it's summary statistics-free because you have a complete representation of the tree. 
the idea is that the neural network will somehow learn the summary statistics that it needs, the, uh, an intermediate representation from which it can then predict the parameter values. And as well, it can account um, for general setting. So let's say you can cover huge parameter subspaces and trees of varying uh, tree size. This is something very important. Um, for example, in real time, um, real time epidemics um, assessment, when you have just every day a couple of new samples, uh, you can edit, reconstruct a tree, and then uh, predict the parameter values without the need of retraining a network, which can take quite some time. Okay, and so when you um, when you develop such a method, the first question that we had to face was how to represent data trees. There was no obvious way how to do it, um, and Furthermore, what kind of architecture you will combine with your representation. So there are different neural network architectures that uh, work differently uh, with different representations. Um, and you, you have to try to, to find the one that works well with your data. And so uh, this is just to present you our representation that we call complete bijective letterized vector. So there are several words. One of them is letterized. Um, so let's assume that we have our tree here, data tree, and now we will letterize it. What it means? Uh, it means that for in each internal node, we will look at the branch on the left, we will look at the branch on the right, and the branch that supports the most recently sampled tip will, um, will be put to the left. So for example, for capital A, it's E that is on the right branch, so we will rotate the capital A. And we do this for all internal nodes. So for example, for capital C, it's already on the left, the, the, most, um, the branch that supports the most recently sampled tip. So we keep it as it is, and we don't rotate the internal node. So now we have a laterized tree, and we will uh, visit the internal nodes using tree in order traversal. So it's very classical. Um, algorithm to visit a tree. The idea or how you can picture it is that you go like this around the tree from left to right. And each time you pass below a node, you will visit it. And at that moment, we write down its distance to the root. So first we write down the distance of small e, then capital D, small d, capital B, etc., until we have visited the whole tree. And so this gives us um, a vector. We then, um, we then separate the information relative to the, the tips and to the internal nodes into separate rows. And as I said, we want this to be applicable to, to trees of varying size. So uh, we, just, we just complete it with zeros so that we would each time have a, have a vector uh, with the same size. Uh, and additionally, um, as Anna mentioned, for these kind of models, you need at least one uh, parameter to be fixed so that they would be identifiable. So we edit, add to it as well the sampling probability to this representation. OK, so this is the vector. Now, uh, this is just to, this is the representation. This is just to show that it's uh, bijective under, uh, under some mild assumptions. So here we have our representation. From this representation, we can imagine the branches with individual uh, internal and uh, external nodes. And then when we, we can collapse these branches, branches from left to right, and we obtain the original tree. Um, another point is that this representation is as compact as possible. So for an n-tip tree, the vector has the size of n, uh, 2n minus 1. Uh, yes, 2n minus 1, while it contains uh, 2n minus 2 pieces of information on the distances. So it's very, very compact. And this helps as well the deep learning to, to learn from it um, effectively, because efficiently, because uh, the, the information is not further diluted in the representation. And so this is the representation uh, that we developed, and we combine it with convolutional neural networks. So uh, just a 
very short introduction on convolutional neural networks. It's a special kind of neural networks where you that is based on um, this uh, basic unit that is uh, a kernel, a convolutional kernel. And um, you can imagine it here, it's a small matrix three times two. And you can imagine it as a convolutional function that is applied on the input of the kernel. Uh, so it will be applied, for example, for this part, and then it and it will yield one single output. And then it would uh, will move through the input until it has covered the whole uh, at, until it went through the whole input. So each time it moves by one, and each time it adds one uh, transform input. Um, then typically, so the idea is that this kernel learns uh, one pattern. Uh, learns to recognize and extract one pattern in the input. And you can have uh, typically, for example, 50 uh, kernels, um, each one learning one pattern to recognize in the input. And so you will you can stack it then to what is called feature map. Here, one column corresponds to one the output of one kernel, transformed input uh, by one kernel. And typically, you can have um, you can stack several convolutional layers. Then you have some pooling operations that uh, enables you to keep the the size of the feature maps uh, reasonable. And then you will have an output, which can be, for example, a vector of I don't know 100, um, 100 numbers, which is then fed to a densely connected neural network that will then at the end output the parameter values. And so we trained um, these convolutional neural networks on the re representation to predict parameter values. Uh, why this works, uh, we did not prove it, but uh, it was the intentional design is that um, usually in uh, uh, trees, the most informative parts are small subtrees. And so you can imagine that uh, these kernels, they learn on the subtree. So actually, small subtree, uh, the same subtrees branched at different parts of the tree uh, will have very similar representation. And this might be why uh, the convolutional neural networks work on this representation. And so uh, this was the network. Now let's go to the result. So we have trained first the neural network to, to predict the infectious period and the uh, basic reproduction number um, on simulations from the basic birth death model. Here we show, again, relative errors um, obtained with BS2, uh, the, the state of the art, and our uh, convolutional neural networks trained on our representation. And um, uh, yes, that should be all. So as you can see, we have basically the same accuracy for this model for both basic reproduction number and infectious time. And this was great news when we learned this, uh, because as Anna said in the first part, this model has closed form solution. So this means that the, um, the accuracy that you can obtain um, is like for this model, the, the predictions are as accurate as possible. And so this means as well that with our method, we can get uh, predictions that are as, as accurate as possible. Uh, so this was, that was great news for us. And as well, our approach is 100 times faster. Here, it's not too much of a difference um, because the, the BS2 is very, very fast. And so we move to more complex models. So this is the BDEI model that uh, Anna presented. Um, we are typically interested in predicting the basic reproduction number, the incubation period, and the infectious time. And once again, we compare the BS2 with convolutional neural networks uh, trained on uh, our representation, the CBLV. So uh, you can see here that for um, incubation period and infectious time, our approach, our method was a bit uh, better than the state of the art. This was in part explained by the fact that for BS2, for 10% of the simulations, either it did not converge after, after extended time or um, it had high relative errors for some reason for at least one parameter, more than 100%. Um, 
And uh, here, the gain, uh, the, the computational gain is uh, very important. Obviously, we here we take into account only uh, the time of prediction and not of the training of the network. Uh, so here it's going from 57 CPU hours to 0 0.2 seconds. And this is the most complex model that we will present today. It's the birth death with super spreading. Um, the idea, very briefly, is that you have, uh, within your infectious population, you have two classes. You have individuals that transmit the disease at way faster rate uh, than other part of the popula infectious population and they are as well at very low fraction um, in the population. And this can be, for example, because the immunity system is not uh, functioning well, uh, and thus they are uh, much more infectious. And so uh, this, uh, for this model, typically we are interested in the basic reproduction number uh, in the infectious time. At We are interested at how many more times the, the super spreading uh, individual transmit the disease than the normal spreading individual, and then at what proportion uh, the super spreading individuals are in the population. And so, for in this case, um, we obtained um, results that were more accurate than the state of the art for than the state of the art for all four parameters, um, as well partially due to the to the fact that for 21% simulations, the piece two uh, had some problems with converging or with high relative errors. Um, once again, it was much faster. And there is one interesting point, um, which is that for the parameter of the fraction of super spreading individuals in the whole population. So if you don't have any signal in your data, you will have on average an error of 34%. And our network yields 26%. So it's a better, a bit better than nothing, but it's not very accurate. Uh, this might be due to the fact that there is not enough signal in such small trees for to estimate this parameter. So this is just to show that uh, the neural networks are not magic ones that would uh, help you to to uh, to predict anything. If there is a inherent problem with the signal, it cannot resolve it. Okay, so then. This was for parameter inference, but we were also interested in classification. So we here we have trained uh, convolutional neural networks on simulations from the three models to predict under which uh, or with which model the given simulation was obtained. So it's a classification problem. Uh, we have used pretty much the same neural network. We just needed to change the cost function because it's classification, um, and we needed to change the activation function of the output layer. So these were the changes. And so these are the results. So here we have just confusion matrices. So in columns, you have the models under which the simulations were actually obtained. And in rows, you have um, the predicted class. And so in, in red, you have misclassifications, and in green, uh, you have correct correct um, correct predictions, and so we have obtained all in all an accuracy of ninety one percent, which was the same as the state of the art as the piece two. Here we did not penalize um, the fact that for twenty four percent of the simulations, um, it did not converge after extended time. And here is a very short application, uh, just to show that it works on real data. Uh, so we have used um, a set of uh, phylogeny obtained with data from Swiss cohort study um, that contains uh, HIV-infected men having sex with men, so population, and that was uh, studied previously by Dr. Rasmussen. And uh, there is a couple of, couple of uh, results. First result was that the model that was selected was BDSS, the birth death with super spreading. And uh, then we obtained with this model uh, relatively realistic uh, predictions, like super spreading individuals at 7.5% and uh, transmitting the disease at nine times higher rates. And one important thing uh, using neural network is to uh, make sure to do plenty of safety checks. So here is just an example. 
So with the, the predictions that we obtained, we uh, performed maybe 10,000 simulations and um, we then performed PCA on the summary statistics with these simulations and we projected our real uh, real tree, our real phylogeny. Just to be sure that uh, this is the trees that are alike, our real phylogeny, um, were in the training set as well. That it's not completely abnormal um, data. And so this was the, the work that was published uh, last summer. Since then, there was a couple of studies. Um, the first one uh, uh, we transferred with Sophia Lambert and Ellen Morlon, this technology to diversification analysis. The idea is that they use the same kind of models, the birth death models. So it was, um, so we needed to adapt it uh, to apply the to the trees that they use. And as well, we extended the representation with uh, tray data. Um, so somehow state data, or let's say with some dummy variables uh, included that correspond to, to data um, uh, that you have on the state of external nodes. And um, another study, which was done by Ismail and Florian, um, they took one step back and they compared plenty of different architectures with plenty of different representations. Um, important or very interestingly, they looked at the graph neural networks, which are special class of convolutional neural networks that apply directly to phylogenies. So there is no need of uh, representation like we do, um, but uh, it can learn directly from the phylogenies. Nevertheless, for some limitations, current limitations of the method, it did not uh, outperform, but um, I think it's just a question of, of some time uh, until you will obtain as well. Like uh, there is no reason that it would not uh, perform very well, uh, even, even like better than uh, the CNN. Um, there, there is another paper that um, extended the CBLB and transferred this uh, technology to the domain of phylogeography um, by Dr. Thompson and Landis. I think that you will hear about it uh, on the next seminar. Um, they showed uh, as well that this kind of approach is as robust as the likelihood methods. And it's uh, super interesting work. Um, there is still plenty to be done. So you can imagine better sanity checks. What I have presented, these sanity checks, they rely on the use of summary statistics, but you can imagine ways uh, how to get rid of these summary statistics so that you are still not dependent on them. Uh, then as well, it would be very in interesting, and we did not do this, uh, to look into these kernels and what actually they learn. And this could be actually in future very interesting because if you develop a new model, uh, this could tell you where is the information on each parameter uh, in the tree, and so understand better the tree as well. Uh, then uh, this method needs to be somehow adjusted to apply to slowly evolving pathogens such as SARS-CoV-2 um, because they represent low temporal resolution. And so this can be taken into account or must be taken into account in the training data because uh, there are plenty of polytomies in, in such phylogenies which are not in the training data here. So um, another thing, and this was actually why we did all of this uh, in the first place, is uh, because we hope that this method can unlock the, the creativity um, and that many new models uh, can be can be developed and used to study um, epidemiologically relevant questions in the field. Uh, the idea is that you don't need any more the likelihood and you don't need uh, summary statistics, hopefully. Um, for example, it can help us to understand better the sampling biases, uh, such as contact tracing, uh, that have impact on the phylogenies. Um, and it could, as uh, intentionally, it's a, it, should, it could be used for real-time assessment. It could help us to compare the, the different health politics and um, policies, health policies in different areas and how they work um, to contain the virus or any kind of pathogen. 
Um, and finally, uh, one pain point for us before the reviews uh, was to apply this method to extensive data. So here, everything that I showed you was applicable only to trees of 200 to 500 tips, but reviewers uh, got this uh, idea um, or got this idea, uh, wanted us to, to show how we could apply it on much, much bigger trees. And uh, Anna uh, got the answer. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, okay, so the problem we faced is that like we have this um, model that is pre-trained on a set of trees of a certain size, so let's say between small m and big m, and let's say that the small m is 50 and the big m is 74. And we have a larger tree, so for example, this one here that has 271 tip, and we would like to estimate the parameters on this larger tree without uh, retraining and redoing all the uh, estimators. So what are the strategies uh, that we could take? So first of all, like we could simply sub sample our large tree. So we could uh, randomly pick um, big M tips among the tips of our tree and keep and prune out like the, the other tips. So here, this is like the subsample tree is in blue. It covers about 30% uh, of branches of the original tree, but also it actually changes the um, parameters of the model because like the sampling probability becomes low for this tree than for the original one. Another strategy could be, uh, let's just take the top part of the tree. So like, let's uh, take the top part that includes the M oldest tips. So this would correspond uh, to the fact that like, if our initial tree represented an epidemic uh, where we sampled like, pathogens uh, till a certain moment in time, till now, for example, here it, it would represent an epidemic where it was sampled till a moment of time in the past. So it's still the same epidemic, the model parameters are the same. However, we only have um, about 30% of data. Uh, as uh, that we had in the initial tree. So then we could take yet another strategy is like, how about we pick uh, just independent sub epidemics within our epidemic. So this would be independent clades that don't intersect and then maybe estimate the parameters on them independently and then average the values. So with this strategy, like on this tree, we'll cover about half of the branches. So it's already better. And then finally, we decided that actually we can combine these uh, strategies and uh, cover as many branches as we can while taking an independent sub-epidemics of uh, the given sizes between small n and big m. And with this strategy, we can cover, well, for this tree and these uh, settings, uh, about 70% of branches. And the idea is that, uh, the, um, well, so as we had independent clades, like for example, if we take the top part of the tree, then uh, if the sampling period started at a certain point of time, then for everything that was sampled after that point of time, it corresponds to an independent epidemic. So for example, for this subtree, like no tip was sampled before this date. So all this was hidden for this sub-epidemic, so, and then this is completely independent. So in practice, we do a post-order tree traversal where at every node that we visit, we compare the two strategies. Like either we treat the left and the right uh, child independently, recursively, picking like whatever the best strategy we have for them, or we take a top part of the tree and then we take whatever we can take more from the parts uh, that are after the end of the sampling of the top part of the tree. And so we compare the two strategies and keep uh, the better one. And we do it like for all the nodes till we arrive to the root. And then we pick uh, the best strategy for the root and unroll it recursively for the other nodes. So for file deep, if we do that, so for file deep, um, uh, the trees that we have as uh, in the pre-trained set, um, 
vary between 50 and, 200, uh, and 500 tips for BDE and BDEI models and between 200 and 500 tips for BDSS. So it's larger for BDSS because it's a more complex model. There are more parameters and we need more information to estimate them. So here we uh, assessed this uh, sub-epidemic picking strategy on the trees between 5,000 and 10,000 tips. We simulated 100 trees. So already like for um, sub-epidemic tree picking, like for BD and BDI, we cover almost all the branches. For BDSS, we cover a bit less because uh, it has uh, stricter constraints on the sub-tree sizes. And then uh, what we do, we estimate for each parameter, we estimate its value on a, each picked subtree independently. And then we average uh, the result, uh, weighing it by the tree size. And surprisingly, it works really well. So here, uh, we're looking at 100 simulated trees or between 5,000 and 10,000 tips in pink. And for comparison, in gray, we have um, just classical uh, file deep strategy where we trained on the trees between 200 and 500 tips and we are predicting the parameter values for trees between 200 and 500 tips and uh, in pink we were first cutting the big trees and then we're predicting the values with this new strategy so what we see here is that uh, with larger trees the relative errors decrease for all the models bd uh, bdei bdss and all the parameters so it's, it's really good news and it's really important to have larger data sets if we can have larger data sets and larger trees. And um, finally, we compared the maximum likelihood approach for the birth death exposed infectious model in blue uh, with the deep learning approach in green. So this is on the medium trees of between 200 and 500 tips where a file deep is not, uh, it's just applying them directly without any cutting. And we can see that uh, the errors are very comparable. So file deep performs really well, as Jakub has shown you with the birth death model. And for the large trees, uh, if we uh, compare the errors, so here file deep is cutting the trees and uh, BDI is just taking uh, the whole tree. So the uh, Pi BDI is performing better because it has more information. However, both of them have uh, drastically decreased uh, the errors. And again, like it's, it shows that it's, uh, it's really good to have larger data sets and the larger the tree is, like the closer we are to real parameter values. And also that um, surprisingly enough, uh, with this uh, cutting the big tree, we can use the pre-trained uh, approach for smaller trees and it works uh, really well. So if you'd like to try file deep, uh, you can use it as a Python package in command line or as a Docker or singularity container. And uh, with this, I'd like to wrap up and thank all our collaborators involved in these projects. So uh, colleagues from Institut Pasteur, in particular Olivier Gasquel, um, mathematicians from Laboratoire Jacques-Louis Lyon, uh, Frederick Escht and Yvonne Medé, who are specialists in numerical um, approximation of differential equations, uh, Veronika Boshkova from Vienna, who uh, performed the comparisons with BIS2, and uh, Sofia Lambert and Hélène Morlon from ONS, uh, who together with Jakub transferred this technology to micro, uh, macroevolutionary studies. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much for the, the very, very interesting talk. Um, I have lots of questions, but people should feel free to post a questions in chat. Um, so can you just clarify for the first part of the talk, oh, like, what are the classes of models that are amenable to this type of analysis? Uh, so the, for the first part of the talk, it's like any multi-type birth death model with constant rates. So um, wait. Yeah, so it has D states, like and state changes, rates and transmission rates, removal rates, and sampling probabilities. Cool. OK. 
Nee, dat was hem. Um, and on the, I, I'm sure you described this clearly in your paper, but um, can you just clarify here how the timing works? So obviously, I mean, if, if you if you want to run a beast two model, I assume that you just put in the sequences and you get out your parameter estimates after some period of time. For fallow deep um, and also the differential equation based models, we need to have a tree. And so, how does that work? So there's sort of two sub questions. So like, I mean, so <laughs> timing a Bayesian inference algorithm is of course tricky because it, you know you can run it forever. Uh, so like, how how do we know it? how how did you stop it for the reported timing values and then also um yeah where did the tree come from that you used for the various methods yes i uh, i don't know if i know you want to answer otherwise okay. i can answer as well so <clears throat> here for the comparison uh so we compared on simulations um and as input of the file deep we take only um already dated phylogenies. So it's presumably like well-reconstructed phylogeny for which you would apply it. OK, so you're you're putting in the correct simulated trees. So there's no yes. possibility for phylogenetic error. OK, well, that seems like in, it would be important to, to, to figure Assumption. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, think about how the accuracy goes if you put in some other type of tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for beast, it's the same tree. Like actually, for beast, the tree is fixed, and it's the same correct tree. I see. I see. So it's just the ODE side of things. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like something important to sort out. Um, yeah, it's interesting. The subtree at the very end of the talk, the subtree thing. I guess I sort of wonder, like, to what extent do they actually need to be independent? Like uh, you came up with this nice algorithm to sort of cut the tree up into like independent subtrees, but like, what if we just like I don't know took in a bunch of overlapping subtrees? Would that actually be problematic? That's a good point. Like I don't know. Like we actually we didn't try that. Like because yeah, we could imagine that we just like subsample the tree again and again and again. Uh, we obtain slightly different trees. We estimate the parameters and then sort of average. Yeah. Um, I don't know what would happen. Yeah, like so. So the idea here is that like we would use as much information as possible, but uh, like if we if they overlapped, then we would use some information several times. And that's presumably but, bad in certain circumstances, but who knows? Yeah, but <laughs> we haven't tested it. Yeah. Um, I was interested. So Jakob, yeah, like you pointed out the the this more recent paper that compared lots of different architectures, and you know so. Yeah, I was also surprised that like the DAGNN, this like graph neural network, didn't seem to be performing especially well. But you still perform, you still express some enthusiasm and sort of, you said like eventually those things are going to win out. And so, are you just thinking that like, like what makes you say that, or you just feel that like this? I mean, in principle, one should be able to use the tree directly. And so, I would have believed that here it's. Um just because of the hop neighborhood. So you have some loss of information when you integ integrate or pass through the whole tree. Um, and I would have said that, uh, I don't know what it would mean for the neural network. Probably you would need to supply again um, this kind of information for some from, like to have some kind of memory yeah. Uh, that would reinforce after several hops. Um, this is just uh, an intuition like this. It's not, <laughs> I'm not at all specialist of these kind of trees, but this is uh, why I would think that in future it should be, yeah. it should work way better because it's a, actually the tree that is the input, not a representation of the, of the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. I mean, I guess one thing, I mean, you all have your package um, for this. I guess I'm sort of interested in like the long term. How is this all going to pan out, right? Like, um, so I mean, it's standard these days. If you have a new inferential model that, you know, well, maybe you're a maximum likelihood type person to express it in our package and it goes into that canon of things, or maybe you have. Uh, a Bayesian type model, and it goes into one of the beast packages. Um, 
And so there's this sort of nice universality, right? Like, um, you know that if you wanted to perform a different, a specific type of analysis, you can go someplace and do this. But I just wonder, like, do you, do you imagine Philodeep becoming sort of like a universal beast type thing? Um, or like, and also like, there, like, to what extent do we need to have like a unified simulation framework? All these sorts of questions, I mean, make me wonder, I, I don't want the research um, landscape to become totally fractured among like, well, you had to find this weird, like this weird package to do this, I don't know, specific type of inference. Anyway, so I, I, I've said enough. Uh, where is this all going? <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are not currently developing any multi package, unfortunately. It's it would be amazing if it uh, could serve as a platform, but uh, unfortunately, I mean, I left academics, and uh, Anna has plenty of other research going on as well. So unfortunately, I don't think that. Uh, I mean, it's completely open, and we will be happy to <laughs> to share with someone who wants to take the the the, the torch, but. Uh, Yes, <laughs> we don't have any, yeah, any further plans. But yeah, I mean, I wasn't sort of assigning that to you. I guess I'm just sort of thinking, like, I mean, maybe we can just say more generally, like, what are the prospects for a uni like a beast type Swiss Army knife? Uh, I mean, maybe maybe it's not so complicated. I mean, you have your encoding. Um, you have, you know. You can train things, so then you just need to think about what are the different types of simulations and things like that. Yeah, so maybe what it's going to become is just like people will have this encoding or like maybe some other encoding would come up. And then like when you have a new model, you just perform the simulations, you encode it and you retrain like following either this architecture or maybe like if there is a better architecture proposed. So maybe there won't be like a package package or like a tool that is universal, yeah. but it's going to be more like an approach that could be used for very large data sets. You could sort of imagine that like that there's there are sort of as we've seen with language models, there are you know if you have a big enough training corpus, you can sort of train some sort of universal thing and then have whatever application it is that you want. So if you had some sort of like universal type encoding, you could imagine fine tuning it to a specific application. That's, yeah. That's obviously for another day. <laughs> Interesting. OK, we do have a question from Emma Thompson, who's going to be speaking next. So uh, he asks, do you, have you explored analyzing credible sets of trees to quantify the influence of tree uncertainty on phylogy prediction uncertainty. That's a great point. Unfortunately, we did not. <laughs> we just tested um, adding noise, um, noise to the branch lengths and to see when it, when, when it breaks. So I believe that in our case, it was like to add um, random noise about 5% to each single branch. And then it, um, the, the accuracy really dropped. But we did not. Uh, it's actually a super interesting point. Yes, I. I mean, I think there's another point there too, which is, um, yeah, getting credible interval intervals out of something like Phylogy would also be really good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, actually, we have um, used approximate um, bootstrap to obtain uh, CIs. But another way would be as well to to obtain uh, like when you reconstruct a tea, tree, you can get a whole forest and to use them as an input and obtain as well uh, um, a distribution for the for the parameter values. Cool. Well, I've let us get well over time. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, thank you very much, um, and thanks for your engagement with Alison. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.